Hey everybody, how's it going? My name's Paul, I started the DiceyReview.com, and today we're going to be reviewing a game called Vikings Gone Wild. Woohoo! This is an incredible game by um, Lucky Duck Games that will be coming out in early 2017. It is a deck building, village building game that is a blast to play. If you're a fan of games like Imperial Settlers, if you're a fan of games like Marvel Legendary, you will really enjoy this game. We're going to get right into how to play the game, but first we're going to show how the game is set up. As you can see right here, we've got a player board that's been set out. Now this is going to have some spaces for some different cards, and we'll go through those to set things up. The very first thing that you want to do is you're going to want to place out your town hall cards. Now you're going to have three different town hall cards, level 1, level 2, and level 3. You're going to place them on your player board with level 1 on top. And then we're going to place out our actual player deck. All right, so we're ready to make up our actual player deck. Now every player is going to start with six beer, two warriors, and two gold. What you're gonna do is shuffle those up and then you will draw five cards and that's your starting hand. But just to start things off, we'll go ahead and give this a quick shuffle and place this on our player board in the space designated deck. After that, we're ready to get our active missions. Now there are mission cards that are included with the game that have these blue backs on them. What you're going to want to do is shuffle up all of the one victory point missions and deal two out to each player. These are my active missions to start the game and you'll place them right there on the space provided. The last thing that you'll want to do is give each player this double-sided player reference. It'll give you the different steps within the round and it'll also give you uh, the different victory points that can be scored by attacking later in the game. So you'll want to go ahead and place that next to the player board and then people are ready to go. Alright, so the next step is going to be setting up the actual board itself. Now as you can see out here on the board, there are multiple different locations that have cards printed on the board. This is going to show you which cards will go where. Over here on the right side of the board will be all of the buildings that will be laid out that you can purchase later in the game. Over on the left side of the board is where you will put both offensive and defensive units. Down here on the bottom is going to be the four bonus cards that will be placed that will help in-game scoring. Down here are the Divine Favor cards that will be very powerful cards that you can put in your deck as you score certain amounts of points throughout the game and attack Town Halls. And then up at the very top is going to be the Odin's Path track, which will also be uh, more powerful cards that can be used to supplement certain strategies depending on how you want to play. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to shuffle up all of the different cards in the Divine Favor track, on the Odin's Path track, and the different bonuses, and I'm going to place them out so that you can see what it looks like after we're done. Alright, as you can see, the Divine Favor cards have been shuffled and two have been put out face up. The ten included cards that come with the game for the bonuses have been shuffled and four have been placed face up. And if you actually kickstarted the game, you'll have more of these bonus cards that you can use as well. And then as you can see along the top of the board, the Odin's Path cards have been shuffled, five have been placed face up, and the deck has been placed on the left side to draw from throughout the game. Now, these spots here in the middle, there's going to be stacks of the cards that are printed. So there's going to be a stack of the Gold Factory, there's going to be a stack of the Brewery, there's going to be stacks of the Picketer cards and things like that. You're just going to place the stacks of cards on the spaces listed for them. Alright, so as you can see, all of the buildings have been placed in their spots that are listed for them, and then all of the offensive units up top and the defensive units down below have been placed in the spaces provided for them. The very last thing to do is we will shuffle up the uh, active mission deck, and we'll place these components near the board. These are gold cubes, beer cubes, and then construction and damage tokens as well. Now there's a little bit of a trick to shuffling the active missions deck, and I'll talk about that here in a second. Alright, when looking at the active missions deck, you're going to see that there are some active missions that reward one victory point, 
and there are going to be some active missions that reward two and three victory points. What you're going to want to do is shuffle up the two and three victory point active missions and place them on the bottom of the stack so that they're drawn later in the game because they're more difficult to complete. After you do that, the active mission deck is shuffled and ready to go. You're going to place your starting player tokens on the uh, beginning guild hall up here in the left and then you are ready to begin the game. Now that the board is set up and we have our player board set up as well, we're going to begin to play the game. The first step in the game is the drawing phase. This phase will have every player draw five cards from the top of their deck, which will be their starting hand. Now you can draw anything from units to resources, and as you can see here, I've drawn resources. So I wouldn't necessarily be able to attack the other players, but I can use these resources to buy different cards on the board that will help make my deck stronger. Now, the second step in the game is the production phase. And since we don't have any buildings that produce just yet, we're going to skip that for now and go directly to the player phase where we will use our cards to take actions. So we've drawn a hand of cards, and we've drawn all resources as you can see. So what we would be able to do if we drew a hand of resources is buy other cards that are on the board. Now I've taken some of the cards that are on the board and put them down here so that we can see them more clearly, and I can illustrate what they will do for you and how to buy them. When you're looking at the cards on the board, you're going to see a number here in the top right with a corresponding color. This is what the card costs in resources. So for instance, if you wanted to buy the brewery, it would cost two gold. So on a player's turn, if they had drawn the hand that we have, they could say, what I'm going to do is spend my two gold and I will buy this brewery. Now this is a deck building game, which means that usually when you buy a card, it's gonna go into your discard pile and you'll shuffle it and draw it later. These are interesting though. The buildings will actually be placed in your village. So what you would do is you would take the village card, the brewery that you've built, and it would go next to your player board right here, and it would produce goods for you later in the game. So this one doesn't get put in your discard pile, it gets put in your village. So that would go right there. Now that we've spent our two gold to buy the brewery and place it in our village over here, we have three beer left that we could spend if we want to. Now on your turn, you're going to be able to spend all of your cards or discard them. So for instance, if we didn't spend this three beer to buy a unit or buy some type of a building, we would just have to discard it at the end of the round. So it's good to spend everything that you can to maximize your turn. So let's say for instance that we had this three beer left and we see an elf archer out on the board that costs three beer. To end our turn, we could say we're gonna spend this three beer and this elf archer is now going to be in our deck. Now for now, you would place this Elf Archer with all of the cards that you've spent during the round, and at the end of the round, you would shuffle all of the cards into your discard pile. The reason this is important is that there are some cards in the game that will allow you to resurrect cards uh, and play them on your turn. You would not be able to buy a card and then instantly resurrect it though, because it has to be in your discard pile. And your cards that you buy don't get discarded until the end of the round. So it's important to make that distinction. All right, so I wanted to make a quick note before I move away from purchasing cards, is that you can also buy these defensive units for the price listed, and you can also buy the cards on the Odin's Path track for the price that they have listed. So almost every card on the board can be purchased. The only ones that cannot be purchased are the undead zombies on the Odin's Path track that you will be attacking, and the bonus cards and the divine favor cards along the bottom of the board. Now, let's say that on our turn, instead of drawing nothing but resources, we had drawn one of our unit cards from the deck. What we would be able to do with this unit card is attack either other players or the board itself to get certain resources. So let's say, for instance, that we had drawn this elf archer from our deck, and one of our opponents had built a brewery. As you can see, the buildings that you have out in your empire or your village, including your town hall, have a defense value in the top left. 
That is the number of attack strength that you will need to match or exceed to successfully attack that building. So let's say, for instance, that this was the card that I had drawn and I wanted to attack this brewery. I would be able to successfully attack this building with a strength of one more than is actually needed unless the player that I was attacking was able to defend that. So let's say, for instance, that I attacked it. What I could do is I could tell the other player in the game, I'm attacking your brewery, and I'm going to attack with this elf archer. Now, the opponent has a chance to place a defense card out to repel my attack. So let's say, for instance, that I say, okay, I'm going to attack your brewery, and I'm attacking with a strength of two. If the opponent had a defense card that they hadn't played during the round, they could say, all right, I'm going to play a cannon, and now the strength of the building is a three, and that attack would be repelled. Now, if someone who's defending from an attack successfully defends, they get a victory point for each card that's attacking that particular building. So if I had attacked with four units and they were still able to defend it, they would get four victory points. If the opponent was not able to defend with this card, then I would get one victory point for attacking successfully with this elf archer. And you can find that table on the back of this player aid right here that'll show what type of victory points you get. Let's say, for instance, in my turn, I was able to successfully attack five buildings. I would get nine victory points. So as you build your army throughout the game and attack other players' villages, it can be very beneficial to you in the form of victory points. And that's kind of how attacking works, and that's one of the things that you can do on your turn. Now, instead of attacking buildings in other players' villages, you can also attack a couple of spaces on the board. The first space that you can attack is this zombie up here in the middle. There's an undead zombie symbol on the middle of the board that you can see right here. And as long as you have an attack of at least one, you can attack him once per turn to get gold or beer, whichever one you want. In addition to attacking that zombie, you will see from time to time a zombie on the Odin's Path track. Now these zombies require two to attack, two strength, but they also reward a victory point and a resource. Sometimes they'll have beer listed, sometimes they'll have gold. But those are the things that you can attack during the round. Now a quick note, something to mention throughout the round. If you ever need beer or gold and you don't have that resource, you can trade two resources for a resource of the other kind. So let's say, for instance, you wanted more beer and all you had drawn was gold. You could trade two gold for a beer and vice versa. You can also see from the very top that you can trade four gold to reshuffle your discard pile uh, during your turn as well. Now when we look at our player board here, we're going to see that you should always have two active missions. You'll have two active missions until the mission deck runs out. So players will be completing active missions throughout the game, and as they complete them, they will draw another active mission card and place it in the spaces provided. But if you ever need to draw an active mission card and there are none left in the deck, they're gone. You can't draw any more. And that's the way it is for any resource or any card in the game. If you uh, need to buy a warrior and there are no elf archers left or no bone crushers left, you can't buy them unless they're there. But if during your turn you ever meet the conditions on the bottom of these cards, for instance, if you spend at least three beer during the same turn, you can complete this mission and get one victory point. You can complete one mission per turn. So let's say, for instance, that you spent three beer and with the remaining two cards in your hand, you attacked the zombie along the Odin's Path track. You would only be able to complete one of those two missions to get one victory point. But next turn, if you did the, uh, the other mission again, if you completed, uh, if you met those goals again, you'd be able to complete that mission for one victory point or complete a new mission for different victory points, depending on what you draw. But that is completing an active mission. In addition to completing an active mission, you can also upgrade your town hall. Now, if you look at the bottom of the town hall card, you can see that it has an upgrade and five gold cubes. So what you would need to do is spend five gold, either through cubes or cards, to upgrade your town hall. You would then take this town hall card, slide it underneath the bottom of this stack, and you would have a level two town hall that you could use. Now, this is important because your buildings are capped throughout the game unless you upgrade your town hall. So as you can see on this level one town hall card, it's gonna say max five buildings. 
If you're able to upgrade this town hall, you will have a level two town hall that says max eight buildings, so you can build more buildings in your village. The only other restriction on buildings is that you can't have more than three of the same building type at any time. Now that we've talked about purchasing cards and attacking, let's go ahead and talk about the Divine Favor track. Throughout the game, you're going to be moving your player marker when you get certain points along the victory point track. If you ever pass a victory point marker that has this Divine Favor symbol on it, like that for instance, if I was able to get five victory points, I would be able to pick one of the Divine Favor cards that's face up, and you can also draw one of the cards off the top of the Divine Favor deck to pick one of these three. So let's say for instance that I got five victory points, I would get to draw the top card off of the Divine Favor deck and pick one of these three cards to place into my discard pile. Now the Divine Favor cards are very powerful cards that can be shuffled into your deck and used throughout the rest of the game. Every time you draw Grindel, for instance, you can either use him to attack with five strength or you can save him to try and defend against an attack that someone else may be putting against you. The treasure chest is four resources of any type that you need on your turn. You can play that card and pick three gold and one beer, two beer, two gold, whatever you need, or four gold, whatever you need, this card can be four of that type. Valkyrie is very uh, interesting. She can actually attack for three and then bring back a unit from the discard pile to your hand. So she can attack and then raise someone from the dead. These are very useful cards and every time you pass these victory point markers you'll be able to pick one. You're also going to see that certain buildings will give you a reward when you attack them. The town hall is one of the buildings that will reward you for attacking it. As you can see, from attacking this town hall, a level one, you're going to get two victory points. If someone has managed to upgrade their town hall to level two or three, you're going to get a number of victory points, but you're also going to get a divine favor card if you successfully attack that building. That's the other way that you can get divine favor cards, so it's very beneficial to attack player's town hall if you're able to do so. Now that we've talked about purchasing cards, attacking, the Divine Favor card, the Odin's Path track, and everything else really in the game that you can do, we want to talk about two phases that we skipped because no buildings were out on the uh, table yet. We want to talk about the production phase and the storage phase. As you can see, there are two buildings out on the table that you can purchase and buy to put in your village throughout the game. There's a brewery and then a beer container. Now a brewery produces a beer cube and there is a container building that matches that type of good that can store goods throughout the game. So right after you draw your hand in the uh, beginning of a round, if you have any buildings like the brewery or the gold factory that produce a certain cube, you're going to go through a production phase. If there are buildings out that don't already have a cube on them, that building is going to produce one type of that cube. Now these cubes can be used to buy things throughout the round, so you could use this beer cube in addition to any beer cards that you have to purchase goods or buy units or do things like that. Now, if you go throughout a round and you don't necessarily want to use your beer cube or you're not able to buy anything that you really need, during the storage phase, after all players have taken their turns, you can take any beer cubes that have been produced but not used and place them in your beer container to save for the next round. This beer container can hold up to four cubes. An interesting thing is during the storage phase, if you've managed to fill this container up with beer cubes, so let's say for instance that someone had managed to store four beer cubes on this container, you would get a victory point for having a filled beer container. That's the production phase and the storage phase. Now that we've talked about the four different phases of the game, we want to talk about the ending of the turn. Now this is really more like the end of the round. Well, what will happen at the end of the round is all players will take all of the cards that they've spent during the round and place them in their discard pile to prepare for the next round. You'll also look at the Odin's Path track up top. The card on the very right of the Odin's Path will get put into the discard pile face down. The four cards to the left will get moved down one space and a new Odin's Path card will be drawn and placed on the left space of that track. 
You will then take the first player token, which this is the one that they included in the uh, pre-production copy that they sent, and you'll pass it to the player on the left, and then people will begin to draw and produce and start on the next round. If at any time during the round a player manages to reach 30 victory points in a three or four player game, or 40 victory points in a two player game, the game ends and the round will be finished to prepare for end game scoring. So what will happen is, let's say for instance, in a two player game someone had reached 40 victory points. If the remaining player in the game still had a turn left to be taken in that round, they would get to take that turn and then end game scoring would be done to determine the victor. Let's say for instance in a two player game that Blue was the starting player and had only managed to reach 30 victory points during their turn. Let's say that the black player was the second player in the round and they managed to reach 40 victory points on their turn. Since they were the last player in the round, Blue wouldn't get a chance to go again because the round is over. Now, at the end of the game, scoring is going to happen like this. You're going to take the victory points that you've achieved throughout the game, and then you're going to check the end game bonuses on these bonus cards. Whoever has the most of a specific type of card, or the most missions completed, or the most resource cards, whatever the card lists, whoever has the most of that will get the six victory points. They will take their victory point marker and place it on the spot on the board that matches those victory points, and whoever has the most points at the end of the game wins. Hey everybody, how's it going? I wanted to go ahead and give my final thoughts about this game. I've written the thoughts in a review that you can see on the uh, on the web page as well, but I wanted to uh, go ahead and talk about this game because I really enjoy the game, and the publisher was kind enough to send me a review copy of the game, so I wanted to make sure that my thoughts were clearly expressed about what I like about the game and why I think it's a great game to, to back if you can and purchase when it comes out. Um, I'm a fan of deck building games. I have been ever since I've, I've played them. I like Dominion. I like Marvel. Um, I'm really excited about the new Tyrants of the Underdark that's coming out. I've got that pre-ordered and, and being shipped to me. But whenever we saw this game at BGG Spring, um, the theme really drew me in and the board helped out a lot. So one of the things that I like about this game is the design feels incredibly tight and the game seems to, to flow very smoothly. But the other thing that I like about this game is there is um, not just deck building, but there's also engine building in this game. So let's say, for instance, that um, you're a player that doesn't necessarily like direct conflict. There's quite a bit of direct conflict in this game due to all of the unit cards that you can buy and the swords that you can buy on the Odin's Path Track and things like that. So there's quite a bit of fighting. But if you don't like that, if that's something that kind of turns you off about this game, the good thing is, is that you can buy nothing but defensive units and buildings and build your own village and build your own your own engine to kind of you know generate resources and, and defend and try and complete missions and do things like that um, and you don't have to interact with other players at all if you don't want to. Now attacking is obviously a very powerful way to achieve victory points in this game but it's not the only way. I've had games for instance where players have focused on uh, completing these bonus cards down here and haven't attacked me at all. I've rushed out to the lead and triggered the end of the game, but then when in-game scoring happens, the other players zoom past me based on in-game bonuses. So this is a game that um, really gives you a lot of options as far as strategic choice. You can, you know, develop your village and really kind of work on resources and storage and making your strategy interesting with all of these Odin's Path cards, or you can just go straight out all offensive, uh, Blitzkrieg, go at your enemy if you want to, and that's a viable strategy as well. You can also have some really cool interactions with these Divine Favor cards, so there's just a multitude of different strategies that you can use uh, if you really want to dig into the nuts and bolts of this game. That being said, if you're someone who doesn't want to uh, you know, examine every game on a, on a granular level. This is also a game that has a very appealing theme. The artwork is incredible and it's fantastic. This game has artwork similar to what you would see on an iOS game because it's actually based on an iOS property that already exists. 
but that makes the game a lot of fun. It makes it whimsical, it makes it kind of cartoony and humorous. And But there's also enough meat to this game that you can really dig into and go after some of these strategies. Now, um, there's also a couple of expansions that are going to come out to um, make this game even more interesting strategically. There's also going to be a solo variant that uh, comes out as well. It's a $9 add-on to the Kickstarter if you uh, back that. So just a lot of different uh, just a lot of different facets to this game that make it really interesting. At the end of the day, um, it is a game to get the most victory points, and so it's not going to be as thematically interesting as, say, uh, a time stories or something like that, but I really feel like the engine in this game is very strong. The theme in this game is strong enough to where it makes it much more interesting than a game like Dominion or even Marvel Legendary to me, and uh, it's, it's just a lot of fun to play. I've been playing this game with my friends and I've been playing it with my family, and everybody that I've introduced it so far, uh, introduced it to so far has really enjoyed the game. Um, and so, you know, I think this game's a winner. I think if you have a chance to pick it up when it comes out, uh, when it goes to retail, you should absolutely do it. And this is a game that'll provide you enough depth to where you can play it again and again, but it's also a game that's going to be um, lighthearted enough thematically that it can appeal to a wider player base. Um, really awesome game. Really good job by the designer and by Lucky Duck. I, I recommend picking it up very highly. Um, and until next time, thanks, and I'll see you at the table.